Well, thank you for your lovely, uh, kind uh, welcome and invitation to come here and preach again. I thought I may have done enough last time when I came to have put you off inviting me again, but clearly, clearly not. So <laughs> here I am. Um, and I understand you've been looking at um, a series of God's kingdom uh, or God's kingdom generally. And there's so much, particularly in Matthew, uh, about that. Uh, and so I prayerfully considered what we might look at and chapter 18 verses 1 to 14 was what came out. So thank you, Martin, for uh, reading that out for us. I've given it a title and uh, it is The Keys to Greatness in God's Kingdom. Uh, so what might God be saying to us this morning? Well, in good Baptist tradition, I have three themes that I'd like us to consider. Firstly, <coughs> seek positions of service, verses 1 to 5. Now, Louis Pasteur will be probably known, that name will be known to you, was born in 1822. He lived at a time when thousands of people died each year from rabies, Pastor had been work, uh, Pasteur had been working for years on a vaccine. He had planned to begin experimenting actually on himself when he was approached by the distraught mother of a nine-year-old boy called Joseph Meister. Joseph had been bitten by a rabid dog and his mother pleaded with Pasteur to experiment on her son instead. Pasteur agreed and injected Joseph for 10 days with his experimental vaccine. We don't need to have been reminded about the COVID, do we, with uh, the race and the search for a vaccine, how important uh, they are. Can I just move that? Is that, is that okay? Yeah, Fine. Okay. Uh, the trial proved successful and Joseph lived. Shortly before his death, decades later, Pasteur had asked that only three words be etched into his headstone. Joseph Meister lived. They were the three words. Louis Pasteur was undoubtedly a great pioneer of immunology. There are many other people who are considered great in their sphere of expertise or influence. Now, not many of you probably know, but I really like football. Um, <laughs> I have played down at Leylands Park against Burgess Hill many times. <laughs> so Burgess Hill uh, has a fond place in, in, in my heart. Um, <laughs> but of course you'll know, those of you who love football, and we've just had the Euros, Brazilian footballer Pelé is arguably considered the greatest footballer ever to have played the game. Now, supporters of Cristiano Ronaldo and Lionel Messi might have a contrary claim to that. It seems to me, though, that our world is very quick to label many people great, when they could be said to have hardly achieved anything of lasting worth. Of course, there are some people who don't leave you in any doubt as to what they think about themselves. There was a certain boxer from Louisville, Kentucky, who said, I am the greatest. <laughs> Muhammad Ali, of course. We read in verse 1 that the disciples asked Jesus, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And we learn from Mark's Gospel, chapter 9, verses 33 to 34, that Jesus had triggered this question by asking the disciples what they had been arguing about amongst themselves on the road uh, to Capernaum. Naturally, Jesus knew that their argument had been centred around who was the greatest in the group. But the disciples kept quiet. Uh, uh, in face of Jesus' question. You see, they only understood greatness in terms of human 
endeavour, accomplishment and status or outright boasting. The disciples caught up in their constant struggle for personal success were probably embarrassed to give it a go in answering Jesus' question. And I think it's always painful to compare our motives with Christ's. In our, in our passage, after his question, Matthew tells us Jesus called a little child to come to him to help his self-centred disciples get the point. He told them to become childlike, developing humble and sincere hearts. We can see that the humility of a child consists of childlike trust, vulnerability and the inability to advance his or her own cause without the help, direction and resources of a parent. The disciples had become so preoccupied with the prospect of building Jesus' earthly kingdom that they had lost sight of its divine purpose. Instead of seeking a position of service, they sought a position of advantage. Jesus told his disciples in Mark 9 verse 35, if anyone wants to be first, he or she must be the very last and the servant of all. Friends, I think it's easy for you and me to lose our eternal perspective and compete instead for advancement or status in the church. Perhaps one of our excuses may be that it's difficult to identify with children who are seen as weak and dependent human beings with no status or influence. Nonetheless, Jesus tells us that unless we change and become like little children, we will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, our humility should reveal itself in seeking positions of service. There is the story of uh, Indira Gandhi, the former Prime Minister of India, who, when she was a young girl, was taken aside by her grandfather, who wanted to impart some wisdom to her. He said this, Indira, in this world, there are two groups of people. The first group consists of all those people who give their time, money and resources to serve others. The second group consists of all those people who take the first group's time, money and resources. And he said to her, if you want to succeed in life, you must join the first group. Because in it, there is much less competition. <laughs> 16th century Spanish theologian Ignatius of Loyola, I'm sure you all know about him, said, teach us, Lord, to serve you as you deserve. I'm, I'm, I'm just blown away that far. To give and not to count the cost, to fight and not to heed the wounds, to toil and not to seek for rest, to labour and not to ask for any reward, save that of knowing that we will do your will. Many people want to have a legacy. And in some respects, it's no bad thing to desire that. But it's our human nature, isn't it, that we want something to sort of live on after we've died. Louis Pasteur wanted three words for his legacy. For the believer, Jesus calls us to a life of obedience and service. And certainly, I'm sure, I, I certainly won't become famous and not many of us will. Certainly not many of us will be remembered for notable 
achievements, despite how many times I played at Leylands Park. <laughs> and I got man in a match for a cup final there. <laughs> <laughs> Yet you and I can respond to God's voice and word. In seeking and exercising this, we will achieve what so many yearn for, greatness in God's sight. And what a tremendous blessing this is. Our greatest legacy will be those who live eternally because of our service to them for the Lord. Secondly, seek to nurture spiritual growth, verses 6 to 9. Now, I'm sure, uh, like Louis Pasteur, many of you have heard of Stuart Briscoe. He was born in 1930 in Cumbria, England. He died a couple of years ago now, I think, aged 92. And he was a renowned Christian author, international speaker, and became senior pastor, pastor at Elmbrook Church in Wisconsin, USA. And I've always liked Stuart's teaching and preaching. I've got a few of his books, maybe some of you have, and some of the tapes and DVDs. And he tells this story. And it concerns the cuckoo bird. Apologies if you've heard it before. As we know, the cuckoo bird never builds its own nest. So Stuart says, the female cuckoo flies around until it finds an unattended nest with eggs in it. She quickly lands, lays her egg or eggs and flies away. The thrush, whose nest had been invaded, comes back. Not being very good at arithmetic, <laughs> she gets to work hatching the egg. What happens? Four little thrushes hatch, but so does one large cuckoo. The cuckoo is two or three times the size of the thrushes. I know it's a bit sad, this. <laughs> when Mrs. Thrush brings to the nest one large juicy worm, she finds four petite thrush mouths and one cavernous cuckoo mouth <laughs> jostling for the worm. Guess who gets it? Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> a full-sized thrush ends up feeding a baby cuckoo that is about three times as big as she is. You may have seen some of the pictures of this. Over time, the bigger cuckoo gets bigger and bigger, and the little thrushes get smaller and smaller. It's sad. And you can always locate a baby cuckoo's nest. You, as you walk along a hedgerow, you can come across, sadly, the sight of two or three little baby thrushes dead on the path because the cuckoo has thrown them out of the nest. <laughs> you know, nature can be brutal, can't it? <clears throat> now, I'm sure you have found that children, amongst other things, are trusting by their nature. There is a high responsibility encumbrant upon parents, as I'm sure that those of you who have been or are parents, and other adults who influence young children as to how they affect them to trust and grow. We've been there, haven't we, those of us who are, or as I say, have been parents. Here in verse 6, the little ones that Jesus is referring to are young disciples, either young in age or young in the faith. Jesus warned the disciples that anyone who turns young disciples away from the faith because of their own failure to deal with temptation and sin will receive severe punishment. We saw in those uh, verses 8 and 9, it's a rather intense overstatement from Jesus, but he talks about hands being cut off, feet. <laughs> eyes being gouged out. Why is it? 
quite an overstatement because our vital need for self-discipline can't be emphasised enough. The Apostle Paul teaches in Romans chapter 8 verses 5 to 8 that spiritually speaking we have two natures in one nest. Hence my story about the cuckoo. Those who let themselves be controlled by their sinful nature and those, uh, and those who follow after the Holy Spirit. There are the two natures. And all of us, of course, would be in the first category, wouldn't we? If Jesus hadn't offered us a way out. Testimony this morning. But the reality is that the nature you go on feeding, as Stuart Briscoe concludes, will grow. And the nature that you go on starving will diminish. Any relationship, practice or activity that leads to sin should be ceased as believers. We must be serious about removing those stumbling blocks that cause us to sin. If we feed the wrong nature, we're asking for trouble. Friends, I don't know about you, but I find this a daily battle. Some of you are nodding. <coughs> for daily, we must constant, consciously choose, feed if you like, to centre our lives on Jesus with the help of the Holy Spirit. Spirit, because his way brings life, peace and spiritual growth. When we experience difficult and tempting situations, as we have, I, 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 all of you here will have had and experienced difficult and tempting situations. It's the same for all of us. Jesus didn't promise, did he, a life of roses? No. When we have these difficult times come upon us and tempting situations, drawing closer to Jesus has never been more essential. Why is it so essential? Because all Christ followers, not just pastors and leaders, are to seek to nurture spiritual growth where we find it. We will not be able to do this, however, if we ourselves are struggling with temptation. And I believe one of the most important missions of the church, generally, in our modern age when Christian faith is under so much attack, it is to help nurture young people and new believers. There might be some teachers here this morning, or some of you folk who have been, have been teachers, you will know how more and more difficult it is to talk about Jesus officially in school. We are finding now some generations of children coming who never have heard any scripture. And my heart sinks. I, I like quizzes. And uh, uh, on, on the television, there's some you know, good quiz shows. When the, Christ, the questions come up about scripture, really obvious ones, people just don't know. My heart sinks. So, one of the important missions of the church is to help nurture young people and new believers. And this is another key to greatness in God's kingdom. Within the warm and loving context of the church family, and I love your strap line, somewhere to belong and believe. Love it. That's the loving context of the church family, isn't it? I remember talking about the church family a bit, I think, last time, a year ago here. 
And through the guiding of the Holy Spirit, we can seek to help and encourage each other as well to nurture spiritual growth. And thirdly, seek restoration of the lost. Verses 10 to 14. In chapter 9, verse 48 of Luke's Gospel, he states, For he who is least among you all, he is the greatest. In Jesus' eyes, whoever welcomes a child, welcomes himself. Giving a cup of cold water to a person in need is the same as giving an offering to God. By contrast, harming others or failing to care for them is a sin, even if they are unimportant people in the world's eyes. It is very possible for thoughtless, selfish people to gain a measure of worldly greatness. It is possible but not that nice, gentle and unassuming people will also gain the same measure. And of course, it's also possible for professional footballers and a certain American world boxing champion. However, lasting greatness is measured by God's standards, not the world's. Our concern for the little ones, verse 10, must match God's treatment of them. And as such, Jesus gives us this warning. He says, do not look down. Other Bible translations say, do not despise. Giving more teeth to his warning. He also tells us that certain angels are assigned by God to watch over his childlike disciples. And they have direct and continue access to God. These words bring into sharp focus those countries and cultures where children or more specifically young Christian disciples, are undervalued, mistreated, persecuted, even killed. To illustrate his warning, Jesus tells his disciples a parable showing the extent of God's concern and love for each individual human being. Oh, what grace and mercy that even in the face of worldly indifference to him, God gives such importance to the restoration of the human race back to himself. We sang in um, Graham Kendrick's song, didn't we? Um, Flood the nations with grace, God's grace and mercy. Because God gives much importance to the restoration of the human race back to himself. Matthew's account of this parable is similar to the parable in chapter 15 of Luke's Gospel. Both accounts remind us that human beings are very much like sheep. <laughs> we are prone to going astray. Now, I'm sure there's some farmers here or, or agricultural people of some degree. I'm sure Burgess Hill's town in the country, isn't it? <laughs> so you'll know about sheep. They are prone to going astray. Here in Matthew, the wandering sheep are believers. But in Luke's Gospel, the lost sheep represents unbelievers. It may seem foolish for a shepherd to leave 99 sheep to go in search of just one. But the shepherd knew that the 99 would be safe in the sheep pen, whereas the lost sheep was in mortal danger. Because each sheep was of high value, the shepherd knew that it was worthwhile to conduct a diligent search for the lost one and rejoice when it was found. 
Both these gospel accounts stress that God's love for every individual he has created is so great that he seeks out each one and rejoices when he or she is found. Matthew says in verse 14, Your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should be lost. We're seeking restoration of the lost. Indeed, the Apostle Peter, in his second letter, chapter 3, verse 9, reiterates that God is not wanting anyone to perish. Luke reports Jesus saying, I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who do, do not need to repent. I've always loved this verse because I reckon there was such a commotion in heaven when I came to faith. <laughs> Sounds a bit self-focused. But I was a rogue. I got up to bad things. And I came to faith Late. I'm giving my test to me, Martin. Is that okay? <laughs> 39. Oh, my life has, has just not looked back. I've not looked back. <clears throat> we may be able to understand a God who would forgive sinners who come to him for mercy. But a God who tenderly searches for sinners and then joyfully forgives them, must possess an extraordinary love. We sing that song, I don't know if you do, overwhelmed by love. Deep as the oceans, well, I go, I'm, I'm not going to go there because I can't remember all the words. <laughs> <clears throat> this is the kind of love that pro prompted Jesus to come to earth to search for lost people and save them. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for saving my friends here. This is the kind of extraordinary love that God has for you and for me. Praise God. We can get excited about it, can't we? Even on a hot morning. But friends, if anyone here feels far from God, there is no despair because he's searching for you. If you are close to God, you will know and experience that love in a real and tangible way. For when you and I went astray, God came looking for us. And we can all say hallelujah. hallelujah. This should drive us to remember that other people are likely to go astray too. But because each one is precious in God's eyes, when someone does go astray, we are to take the initiative and seek restoration for the lost. We can help God bring him or her back home, rejoicing, as the English Standard Version puts it. For there are no recriminations, no apportioned guilt, just unconditional love. Oh, it's fantastic. It's amazing. How wonderful it is that there is simply joy that the one who has been lost has been found. <clears throat> this is greatness in God's kingdom. May God bless his word to us this morning. Amen.